Welcome to lecture 2.4, Axiomatic Systems. Historically, the ancient Greeks were the first people to study knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Plato founded his academy, where the foundations of mathematical thoughts were born, and Aristotle studied there for 20 years before founding his own academy, and he became known as the founder of Western philosophy. Now, some could quibble with this because they were not just studying knowledge for the sake of knowledge. They thought it was important to educate their fellow citizens because they lived in a democracy. So it still was a change from what had happened previously in other societies where people studied knowledge because they wanted a specific utilitarian purpose. Around 300 BC, Euclid, who's pictured up here, wrote a series of 13 books that he called The Elements. This is a collection of definitions, axioms, and theorems on geometry, number theory, and so-called geometric algebra. Think of things like how to bisect an angle, how to double the square. About 2200 years later, German mathematician David Hilbert axiomized geometry in a book he called Foundations of Geometry. Let's start by summarizing Euclid's axioms first. An axiom is basically a fundamental law that we can't really prove is true, so we just accept it because it's, it's so obvious. So let's start with the first one. Any two points can be connected with a straight line. That's obvious, right? If you have any two points, you can certainly draw a line between them. Number two, any line segment can be extended indefinitely. So if you have a line segment like this, you can just keep extending it forever. Three, a circle may be drawn with any given point as center and any given radius. That also makes sense. If you have a point here and you want to pick a radius, you can certainly draw a circle like this. Four, all right angles are equal. So if you have a right angle like this and another one over here, we say that those things are equivalent or, as Euclid would say, equal. Five, for any given point not on a line, there is exactly one line through the point that does not intersect the line. So we have a a point here, and you have, let's, let's use this, this line here, it says that there's basically one unique parallel line to this line. Now this is something that Euclid tried to prove, it's called the parallel postulate, and he was unable to actually do so. He thought that you shouldn't have to take this as a given, it, this should follow logically from these four laws, but he was not able to do that. Thousands of years later, hyperbolic geometry was invented, and in hyperbolic geometry, this axiom fails. So there's a basic assumption here of Euclidean geometry that Euclid is using to guide these axioms, but they're not built into the axioms. These first four are still going to hold in hyperbolic and other geometries as well, possibly in geometries where this fifth rule does not hold. So that's why Euclid had to take this as an axiom, even though he wanted to. He tried to prove it from these first laws, but it, it does not logically follow. Let's now fast forward 2200 years to the future, to 1902, and summarize David Hilbert's axioms of geometry. Whereas Euclid thought he only needed five basic rules to do what he needed. Hilbert wanted to get a lot more out of it, so he, he actually came up with five groups of axioms. The first ones are called the axioms of incidence. First one of those says that any two points have a line that contains them. So if you have any two points, then there is some line between them. The next one says any two points have at most one line that contains them. I should say this is not necessarily for every geometry. This is specifically for Euclidean geometry. 
because if you can imagine, you're going to have spherical geometry, and if you have two antipodal points, like the North Pole and the South Pole, then there are actually a lot of lines that contain those two points. Three, there are at least two points on a line and at least three non-collinear points. So if you have a line, you can always find at least two points on that line. And you can always find a third point that is not on that line. Four, any three non-collinear points, that's points that do not lie on the same line, have a plane containing them. That makes sense, right? Three points determines a plane. Assuming they're not on a line, obviously if you have three points that are on a line, there might be many planes that contain them. Next, any three non-collinear points have at most one plane containing them. So basically, three points that do not lie in the same line determine a unique plane. Next, if two points on a line lie on a plane, then every point on the line lies on the plane. That also makes sense, right? If you have a, a line and that line contains a plane, then every single point, or if two points on that line lie in the plane, then every single point does as well. So there's no way that line's going to dip out and puncture it like that. Seven, if two planes have a point in common, then they have at least one more point in common. Hopefully that should make sense. You can't have two planes that only intersect at, at a single point. And by plane, I mean they go on forever in both directions. They have to meet. If they're going to meet, they're going to meet in at least a line. And finally, the last one says there exists at least four points which do not lie on a plane. So you can if you pick three non-collinear points that determines a plane, you can always find a fourth point that is not on that plane. So th there is no right or wrong number of axioms. One thing you could you may notice is that Hilbert could have combined these two into single axioms, say any two points have a unique line, and these two, any three non-collinear points, have a unique plane containing them. But this is just what he decided to lay out as his basic rules. And basically, the more laws you lay out, the more details and the more structure you're going to have, but then there's, there's trade-offs as well. Okay, so these are the axioms of incidence. Now we come to the axioms of order, and these all have to do with the concept of betweenness, specifically what it means for a point B to lie between two other points A and C. We can formalize this using something called a ternary relation, which is a relation with three inputs, and we'll study relations more in a later chapter. But for now, Let's start with the first one that says if, if B lies between A and C, then A, B, and C are three distinct points of a line. That should be clear. But also, B lies between C and A. So the order here matters. Next, any two points A and B contain a point C on the line A, B, so that B lies between A and C. So let's, let's draw that up here. So if, if we, this is almost the same drawing, but the order of how I draw it matters. So any two points A and B contain a point C on the line between them so that B lies between A and C. So we can always extend, basically says that we can always extend a segment and add a point so B is between A and C. Three. Of any three points on a line, there is no more than one that lies between the other two. That should be clear. B is between A and C, but it's not the case that A is between B and C or anything, anything like that. Um, however, I will say that this, as we've seen with the axioms of incidence, will fail if we're in spherical geometry. So that's why we have to build this. We can't just say a general geometry in an abstract sense, because if we're on a sphere, and the North Pole is A and the South Pole is C, 
and we have, say, B on the equator, then you could make the case, well, B is between A and C. But, of course, this being a great circle, you could just extend it and say, well, hey, look, A is between B and C, and C is between B and A. So this does not happen in Euclidean geometry, which is what Hilbert was trying to axiomize. Okay, the last one. Let A, B, and C be non-collinear. So that means we have, so in this case, we have A, we have B, we have C that do not all lie in the same line. And L, a line in the plane they determine that does not meet these points. So the, these things will determine some sort of plane. And so let's suppose that L, well, first of all, I want to extend the lines through these, these points. So L is a line on the plane that determine that does not meet these points. So L, L might be something like, like out here. But if L passes through a point of the line segment AB, so suppose L actually is a line that goes like this and it hits a, a segment, or point in the segment, then it also passes through a point of either AC or BC. So this line has to either pass this segment AC or this segment BC. And that makes sense. It basically says that any three non-collinear points form a triangle. And any line that intersects one of those edges and does not intersect the actual vertices has to intersect one of the other edges. The third group of axioms are those of congruence. This is a concept that describes what it means for two segments to be equivalent or the same, and also two angles. I use the same term. So if A and B are points on a line L, and C is a point on another line, could be the same, then there is a point D on a given side of L prime through C, such that AB is congruent or equal to CD. So let's draw a picture of this. So here, if you have A and you have B, these are points on a line L, and you have some other line, so this is L and this is L prime, and you have some point C, and you pick a side of C, so either this side of the line or that side of the line, then you can find a point D, so this segment is congruent to that segment. CD is congruent to AB. Two, if two segments are congruent to a third segment, they are congruent to each other. So let's suppose that those two segments that I just drew are both congruent to E and to F, then they have to be congruent to each other. Number three, on a line L, I'm going to draw a new picture here, let Suppose we have three points, A, B, and C, so that A, B, and B, C are segments that have no point other than B in common. So in other words, B has to be between A and C. And suppose we have another line, let's call it L prime, and we also have segments A prime, B prime, and B prime, C prime, with the same property, no point other than B prime in common. And this says if, if AB is congruent to A prime, B prime, and BC is congruent to B prime, C prime, then AC has to be congruent to A prime, C prime. So then the, then the, the uh, I'll pick a different color, then AC has to be congruent to A prime C prime. So the source I got this from had equals, but really these, these should be equivalences like this. Although I'm not sure when historically the, the notion of e equals versus equivalence was made, because I know Euclid talked about angles being equal, and he really should have was talking about congruence. Four says given an angle between two rays on a plane, so we have R1 and we have R2, and we have some angle theta between here, then if we have 
Oh, and to make these easier on a plane, let's just say it's the XY plane, so this, this flat plane here. Um, but it, it still holds if, if these are off in space. Um, and then we have another line, or I guess a, a line, L, on some other plane. I'll use the XY plane again. And a designated side of L, so our, some direction. And then we have a point not on L. We'll call this A. Then there is a unique ray through A that makes the same angle with L. So I'll call that theta. So that should not be too surprising. And finally, the side angle so side property for triangles. This is what you learned probably in high school geometry. Um, this is actually very messy to write out formally, but it's, it's really easy with a picture. All it says is that if you have, I think you know what it says, if you have uh, three points A, B, and C with some angle, say theta, and then you have three other points, say, a prime, B prime, and C prime, and the angle between them is the same, and also the, the side lengths are the same, or in Hilbert's language, and con uh, they were congruent, so if AB is equal to, congruent to A prime, B prime, and BC is congruent to B prime, C prime, then we can conclude that the triangles are congruent as well. I don't know how well this drawing is, but I think you get the idea. Next, Hilbert had an axiom of parallels, borrowed from Euclid, that given a point A not on a line L, recall this, there is at most one line in the plane determined by A and L that passes through A, but does not intersect L. So there's a little bit of choice here. He said at most one line. He could have said exactly one line. But this is some basic fundamental law that you just have to assume, and so there are several ways that we could phrase it. So Hilbert chose to say at most one line. Finally, Hilbert needed two axioms of continuity, as he called them. And these, in some sense, specify things that we are not allowed to do abstractly. The first one actually says something we, we can do, but if you think about what it implies, it implies more things that we cannot do. So this actually dates back to Archimedes. It says, given two segments A, B, and C, D, there exists a number N such that N segments C, D constructed contiguously from A along the ray from A to B will pass beyond B. So let's, let's draw a picture. This is Sounds complicated, but it's actually fairly simple. So let's suppose that this is A, and this is, is B up here. And so suppose you have two, or you have another segment, CD. So let me, let me draw that here. So this is C, and this is D. What this says is that if we take these segments contiguously from A along the ray through B. So if we st stick this little segment right, start, start at A and stick it right here, and then we keep going, and we, we keep doing this, eventually we will pass beyond B. So what this really says is that what we are not allowed to do is have two points an infinite distance apart. So you can't have a line here that goes dot, dot, dot forever. You can't have some sort of asymptote like this. Any two points are a finite distance apart. It probably would have been easier just to say that, but this is how he phrased it. And next, points, this is called line completeness, points cannot be added to lines while preserving the properties that follow from the prior axioms. So you might say, well, why can't we add infinitely many points between here? Or... Maybe we can talk, we talk about infinity, and there's a real movement in, in geometry to, to talk about the point at infinity, and there's a lot of deep mathematics behind what that does by adding a single point at infinity. It's Google compactification, if you want, or just adding the point at infinity. And so that's something that if you, you, know, you could say, well, let's, Let's take a line, maybe here's A and here's B, and let's just say this goes indefinitely, but let's add the point of infinity to it. 
If you do that, you actually create a circle mathematically. And that's, that's not obvious from these definitions, but if you create a circle, you lose the betweenness. So this says that you can't add points to lines while preserving the properties that have followed from the prior axioms. Specifically, things like betweenness, if you try to add extra points at infinity, you will lose things like that. Both Euclid's and Hilbert's constructions are examples of axiomatic systems, which is the title of this lecture. Our goal here is to understand these and how logic plays a role in both of these. Understanding this for a mathematician or a computer scientist or anybody who uses math in their field, which is most people in a STEM field, is analogous to a writer understanding grammar and grammatical structure, or a programmer learning how to write assembly code. It's not something that they're necessarily going to deal with every day or on most days, but understanding the basic structure is important to gaining a holistic understanding of what you're working with. Here's our definition. An axiomatic system consists of, first off, a set or a universe, U. Secondly, definitions, sentences that explain the meaning of concepts that are related to you. These may use undefined terms. At some point, we have to say, well, we know what a point is. We know what a line is. We don't have to define that. We just know what it is. Axioms, propositions that are self-evident. These must include at least the system of logic we've developed. So even though Euclid and Hilbert did not explicitly specify logic like false and true and if, then, and so forth, they were using it. They were behind the scenes. And finally, there are theorems. These are true propositions that are derived from the axioms. Let's do some examples. The first axiomatic system, the most basic one, is propositional calculus. Here, the universe consists of an infinite set of symbols, such as 0, 1, and any variables that we wish to use, like P, Q, R, S, and so on. The definitions include truth tables, operations such as and and not, things that we've defined in previous lectures. There are many ways to define a set of axioms, which are basically logical laws that we just know are true, that will generate all logic laws. Uh, one of the simplest ones is actually due to Polish mathematician Jan Lukasiewicz, and that is the following. It's not in any way clear that these, are, that these suffice to generate all of logic, but it's fun to just see this. So P implies, Q implies P. P implies, Q implies R implies, P implies Q implies, P implies R. I'm going fast enough that you probably shouldn't be wrapping your head around what these are actually saying, but you could pause it if you want to. And finally, not P implies not Q, implies Q implies P. That's like the contrapositive. So there, there are many other possibilities besides this one. This is, I think, the simplest one because it only has three. Sort of like how the NAND function will generate all Boolean functions, but we'd much rather just deal with AND and OR and NOT because even though we, there are more definitions there, it just makes things easier to work with. Examples of theorems that we can derive from these three simple axioms include, for example, De Morgan's laws. So P and Q or R is equivalent to P and Q or P and R. Okay, I'm sure we could derive not not P is equivalent to P 
because that is not one of these axioms, but it is certainly true. And there are so many others. Another axiomatic system is Euclidean geometry. Here, the universe consists of points, lines, and circles. Of course, we could include other things, but we don't need to. We could take those as definitions. So definitions could include parallel lines, triangles, squares, and, and so forth, things like that. Euclid used five axioms in addition to those of logic, and from there he established a whole lot more Euclidean geometry. Hilbert used five groups of axioms. I think he had 20 in total. So he laid down a lot more laws, and that probably allowed him to prove more things. Of course, mathematics had been more developed, so there was more intellectual insight available. How to bisect an angle is an example of a theorem that Euclid came up with and wrote in his book, The Elements, that follows from nothing else than just his five axioms. So why should a student of computer science or computer engineering care about this? Well, take it from none other than Donald Knuth, one of the pioneers of computer science, sometimes called the father of the analysis of algorithms. He said that writing a computer program from a set of specifications is comparable to writing a mathematical proof from a set of axioms. In both, you need logic, reasoning, organization, and clarity of thought. In an axiomatic system, theorems are usually expressed in terms of a finite number of propositions, say p1 up to pn, called the premises. So we'll write, if p1 and p2 and all the way up to pn are all true, then that implies c, the conclusion. Or just, we'll say p1 up to pn imply c. A proof of a theorem is a finite sequence of logically valid steps that demonstrates that the premises of a theorem imply its conclusion. What constitutes a proof can be subjective, and it depends on the audience. Are you trying to convince a group of high school students or a group of research math faculty? Even if you're just trying to convince one group of similar people, people have different standards as to what is a convincing argument and what's not. For example, the four color theorem is a famous result actually in graph theory. You might know it as if you have regions like countries or states on a map and you want to be able to color these regions so that no adjacent region has the same color, then you actually only need four colors to do that. Assuming you don't have, have regions that are disconnected or things like that, um, which of course does happen in real life, but simplistically we assume it doesn't. So for example, here we can use red, green, blue. Let's use blue again, and let me use green up here, and then let me use red in here. So here I only need three colors. Turns out that you can actually represent this as a problem in, in graph theory. So what I mean by that is, is you can put a vertex in every region, and then you could put a uh, running out of colors. I'm not sure what to do here. How about this? And then you can put an edge between any two regions that are adjacent. So we have something like this. So this particular map can be thought of as a as this graph that I'm drawing. Actually, I think I, I missed one. So I have this, and then we have that should so we, so we should have this as well. So you can, return, you can turn this problem into a problem on graphs and talk about coloring vertices in graphs, and now you don't want two vertices connected by an edge to have the same color. So th this was proven in 1976 by massive computer assistants. 
they reduce it down to a whole bunch, I forget if it's dozens or hundreds of, of special cases. And then they just plugged it into a computer and said, oh, none of those cases need more than four colors, therefore we're done. Some peers did not consider that to be fully legitimate. They said, well, you just ran out of cases. There's no logical reason why this is true. It just, it happens to not be true. And also, how well do you trust a computer program that runs for hours or days behind the scenes because you can't check all those cases by hand. So this is an example of, a, of what constitutes a proof and how that can be subjective. Propositional calculus is one of the few axiomatic systems for which any valid sentence can be determined to be true or false by mechanical means. By that I mean digital logic circuits. You can also use truth tables to prove everything if you wanted to. Though most proofs are not going to be at the level of truth tables. Because we build up theorems and then we don't need to go down to the truth table level if we, if we don't want to. As an analogy, every computer program is simply a long sequence of zeros and ones. Though when we write code, we don't just write in binary. We usually have a language and syntax. Every living being is simply a collection of atoms. We certainly don't think of people like that. And all proofs, in theory, can be done with truth tables, though we almost never want to do that because we build up theorems to make things easier in the same way how we use syntax and programming languages to tell a computer what to do instead of long sequences of zeros and ones. In the next lecture, we will return to propositional calculus and we will look at how to prove basic statements in a better method than just writing out the truth tables. So stick around for that. See you then.